Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. I recently stumbled across an article in the British magazine, The Spectator, entitled, Welcome to the End of Democracy. Although I've stopped reading much of the growing decline of democracy gospel because, to my mind at least, it grossly exaggerates the impact of the 45th president of the United States, I was intrigued by this piece, not only because the author did not mention Donald Trump, but because his argument focused on the deeper transformation of American and European societies, the emergence of a ruling technocracy, the use of the pandemic and the environmental crisis to constrain individual rights, the concentration of power in governments and the distance of governments from voters, ordinary voters. And of course, the mind boggling concentration of economic wealth, which is as much an issue in the United States as it is in China. One quote, we may remain, he wrote, as we are now, nominally democratic, but be ruled by a technocratic class empowered by greater powers of surveillance than those enjoyed by even the noisiest of dictatorships. Joel Kotkin wrote that, and is my guest today on New Thinking for New World. He is the Presidential Fellow in Urban Futures at Chapman University in California, an executive director of the Urban Reform Institute, as well as author of The Coming of Neo-Feudalism, A Warning to the Global Middle Class. Welcome, Joel. My pleasure. So let's start with the democracy. If you were a betting man, do you think our grandparents would recognize American democracy as it may exist in, say, 2030 or 2035? Well, I'm not so sure we will recognize it. Um, I mean, clearly what's happened is that And this may be, you know, because my background's in classical history, so I tend to think this way. We seem to be moving from the Republic, the Roman Republic era, you know, which was very much the model of the founding fathers. Um, And and if you look across Europe, almost all democratic systems have some roots in Greek, Roman thinking. Um, I think that we're really headed to a, a, a period where we may be the degree of complexity the size of the, the the countries and the inability of the existing um, mechanisms to function essentially moves power outside of democracy towards a technocracy, a, a technocracy which is a marriage. In the book, I talk about two things: the oligarchs, who are the tech, the tech people, plus their financial ha- hangers-on, um, and um, uh, and th- what I call the clerisy, which is a, a huge class of highly, often very highly trained professionals who are credentialed deep in the bureaucracies, very dominant in the media, very dominant um, in ac- even more so, if anything, in academia. And they've become in alliance with, with the oligarchs, the dominant power. And I would compare it in, in feudal terms to the alliance between the first estate in French or the second estate, you know, the, the clerical class and the, and the aristocratic class. And we're seeing a reprise of that. So democracy, we still have elections. Uh, we still have, if anything, more media than we've had ever in our history. Some of it is air quotes on the word social, um, but all of it is noisy. Uh, There is a robust debate, often about stupid things, but a robust debate uh, in many sectors in this this country and across Europe. Uh, That is democracy. So how does that, how does, where's the car crash come from between what I just described as democracy in, in, in a sense and uh, your concerns about the technocracy and the oligarchs. All right. Well, let's just you know to start with the question of thinking and free thought. Universities, which were once seen as centers of that, are no longer centers of that. I mean, I would say more and more 
students, faculty feel that if I say the wrong thing, it's going to come back at me. Um, you know, the, the, um, self-censorship because of the context. Right. And, and in some cases, real censorship or lo loss of jobs. Then we move into media. Now, what, what, you know, we've had powerful figures before, but you know what? The people who ran General Motors or Volvo or, or, uh, or Exxon, they may have wanted to influence politics, but they didn't want it, but they, they didn't have the power to control it. You know, the, the world of, of, to me, of democracy, let's say, of, let's say in New York City and the turn of the century, yes, there were t powerful economic in, um, interests, but there was a proliferation of newspapers of every kind from different languages, different, different politics going, ranging from social democratic to conservative to, you know, way out um, communist. So that kind of world exists in some ways in the internet, but is increasingly monitored. You know, we never had a situation where, let's say, a, a what is really a common carrier, take Google. Now, it, there's no question in my mind that Google um, now, um, let's say, tweaks its its algorithms to produce certain uh, certain kinds of results. Like if I do research on a topic that I know Google is you know, committed to in one political position, I would find it very difficult to find anything contrary. Uh, and um, I think that's scary. The fact that YouTube uh, and other social media are now saying, well, we're not going to allow for misinformation. Well, what happens if the misinformation becomes right or the misinformation is partially right? Um, what if the misinformation becomes information? Like, but we're going to decide what is allowed, what is not allowed. So for instance, let's say on the climate issue, so Google just came out with a statement saying, we're going to not allow on YouTube, I think it was something, those who disagree with the consensus on climate. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean somebody who denies that there's a climate issue? Or does it mean somebody thinks the climate issue was produced by a different array of factors or would be best addressed this way, not the, the, the consensus way? We saw this with COVID. And that's what was very frightening. I mean, the Great Barrington Declaration, I'm not a doctor. I don't know whether the Great Barrington Declaration, which was an you know, sort of anti-lockdown, sort of more the sort of Swedish approach on on the on the pandemic. It you know the, these were distinguished scientists. These weren't you know crackpots. This wasn't Alex Jones or Marjorie Taylor Greene or you know some you know you know lower form of intellectual life. It was it was a, these were distinguished scientists, and they were being banned. Um. The, the question of a lab leak, which, you know, I think is not at all out of bounds as being possible. Um, uh, you can't mention it. It's misinformation. And then now you can allow it. I mean, the, the, the idea is that we now have a group of people who are the wealthiest people in the world, who have the most influence on the stock market, who also want to sort of limit speech. Now, here's the question. Do you, um, how do you deal with that? Um, I mean, and, and I think there's a significant debate. The problem is the oligarchs are so powerful and have so much money. I mean, look, the Washington Post, which is the house organ of, of the American bureaucracy, um, is owned by Jeff Bezos. We see it in, in, in the film industry. We don't make films that may offend um, the sensibilities of Silicon Valley. I mean, Hollywood is a joke. I, and I've spent a lot of time in Hollywood, okay? And I, I lived in Hollywood for a long time. A lot of my friends are in, in Hollywood. The decisions are now being made in Silicon Valley. They're not being made in Hollywood. They're not being made by people who have any interest really in, in anything other than, uh, you know, making money and maybe getting to hang out with, with stars. I mean, the, these are not, these are not people who, you know, I would say, like, for instance, if the, the difference between somebody who's an oligarch like Bezos, who owns the Washington Post, where I used to work, 
um, you know, you you there's a difference between having somebody like that and a Rupert Murdoch who, for whatever his limitations, is a newspaper guy. He understands the news business. That's his his business. You know, he lives and dies with how the Wall Street Journal and Fox does. Jeff Bezos, the Washington Post could lose a billion dollars a day, you know, and and there would be money to pay for it. I mean, not going to lose a billion, but they'll certainly lose a million. Made this Faustian bargain with the techies. Unfettered access to information. That's what we get. Uh, in return for unfettered access to our personal info, if not our souls, which is what they get. Right. Uh, you wrote that, and, and again, another quote, technological innovations such as artificial intelligence, though tempting as a salvation, would strip away our humanity beyond recognition. It is the logical extension of what you were just arguing a moment ago. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, I did, it must have been about 10 years ago, I did a, a, a the series never, I don't think ever made it, but um, it was um, uh, Spielberg and Katzenberg had a, this thing on the future. And so I was, I was the only one who talked about issues like class and equality and, um, and sort of social order. But in the group um, was Ray Kurzweil and he starts talking about the singularity. And it, it's like, I'm talking to somebody from a, completely different uh, way of thinking, you know, a way of thinking like we were talking, I had just come back from India and he had said, well, India now they have cell phones. And so things are better. I said, yeah, but I've been in Dharavi, which you may be familiar with. And, you know, yeah, you have a cell phone, but you're still living in horrific conditions. Um, You know, the, the, what I find is that the tech oligarchs are, Yet, as a friend of mine who built built uh, housing up in Silicon Valley said, said there has probably been no group in the history of mankind who are less prepared for for to lead a society than these people. That their idea of the social impact of what they do is really minimal. The other thing that uh, we just did a, a interview with a prominent venture capitalist who's a, a a friend of both Musk and Zuckerberg. And one of the things he said was, he said, you have to understand, these people don't really believe in the future of humanity. So their their response is escape. Mark Zuckerberg wants us to escape into the metaverse where so that we we don't even know that we're living like crap because we're, you know, in, in our fantasy world, we're living in, in luxury with the most attractive people we could possibly do uh, do anything with. Um, and then, and then you have Musk who wants to just take us off the planet. I mean, these are not people who are focused fundamentally on improving the lives of, of average people. They're just not. I mean, and this is the danger that, um, I would say, um, that the great reset and net zero and all that stuff sort of really leads to, which is these policies as conceived today, are almost inevitably going to lead to the immiseration of a huge part of the working and middle class. And as I have an article coming out um, in the next few days on this, I, I did with an, with an African friend, the effects on the third world. If, you're, if ESG types are saying you can't build a natural gas, you can't build nuclear, you can't build um, coal, uh, what do you do in countries where the, the electricity supply is is already um, unreliable and and expensive? We know we're we're not even thinking of in these terms. Um, I mean, so but what, what, part of it may also be mentality. Irving Crystal actually made this very good point. He said tech people seem to think of everything as an engineering solution that can be imposed that can solve a problem. That's not the way societies change. If you feel that the world lacks global leaders, please help support the Talberg Foundation programs. Individual donations are being accepted at talbergfoundation.org slash donate. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org slash donate. You've made the point that net zero... Uh, that is to say, a world where we produce net zero greenhouse gases 
And, and recently in Glasgow, countries are and companies are falling all over themselves, whether it's 2030, 2035, 2050, to commit themselves to that net, net zero path uh, is fundamentally reg- regressive. Yes. Uh, explain. Okay. Well, it's regressive because let me say, you know, I think it was written around the time of the Bolshevik revolution, you know, that um, uh, some one famous writer came back and said, I've seen the future and it works. Well, I live in California and I've lived in California for 50 years. I've seen the future and it doesn't work. Um, it, and, and this is what it does. If you have high energy prices and unreliable energy, one thing that's not going to happen is nobody's going to put a manufacturing plant anywhere near where you are. So what we find is even when we're looking at new semiconductor plants or new uh, electric car plants, they're all outside of California, I mean, except for the original Tesla one, which it was essentially gifted. Um, all the expansion is elsewhere. Um, so high energy prices also obviously hurt the poor uh, as it's happening in Europe right now. It's happening in America, you know, to upper middle class people and wealthy people, an extra dollar to a, ga- a, a gallon of gas is, you know, maybe it's a little bit of sushi money. Like you don't order the mo- the most extravagant sushi one night. For the guy who lives, let's say, in Riverside, drives an F-150 to to a construction job in Long Beach, which would be about an hour, hour and a half if you go early enough in the morning, this is ruinous for that person. This could be the difference of $40, $50 a week. This is a big, big difference. So what, what, what it does is it creates... A, a disincentive for a certain kind of industry to locate. And, and, and B, it, it hits people in their, per, in their personal lives. And then there's another factor, which I think is, is I find most disturbing. We're going to commit to essentially deindustrialization of our economy. I mean, that's, you know, Boris Johnson's plan for the UK is deindustrialization. I mean, that's, that's all it can be. And so what we do is we import all the stuff we want from someplace else. But since it's global warming, it, you know, this isn't a virtue signaling contest. This is how do you reduce GHG? Well, if I take a, a, a factory and move it from California or Germany to Texas, you're going to have a bigger footprint, just climate and regulations. But what about the fact that if that business is done in China, which has which now emits more GHG than the U.S. and the EU put together? So basically, this net zero thing may be a great opportunity for the Wall Street types and for some of the Silicon, Silicon Valley types to make windfall profits in a subsidized economy. But it also means that more and more of the future lies in China. And, you know, my sense of it is the Chinese are playing, I'm great, I have great respect for China. I I think I called China's rise about as early as anyone did. <laughs> but I do think that chi- um, the Chinese are playing us really well. They're saying, you know what? Oh, we really like what you're doing. And we'll pledge by 2060, we'll, we'll address this issue. By 2060, Europe and North America will be little more than a vacation playground for wealthy Chinese. That's about where we're headed. And we can already see some of that beginning to emerge um, in certain areas um, on the West Coast. And, um, and, and so what I think is, is, is going to happen is this is, this is um, I don't know, you're, you're old enough to remember Muhammad Ali and Ropadope. I use the metaphor all the time, yes. <laughs> and that's what's happening. China, China, and and you know India will do it in a more chaotic way and and not as focused, not as maybe not as quickly, but developing countries are going to continue to do what they're going to do, and we have to decide whether or not either we're going to have to on your global point for your group, or do we start putting in the GHG content of things made in China or things made in in Mexico. Do we do that in order to protect our industries, or do we allow these products that are uh, that are produced by with much lower uh, um, uh, uh, energy prices? We we can we can decide that 
that uh, we're going to deindustrialize our entire economy. What happens? Some of the tech people, the people in the universities, the people in Wall Street, eh, they 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 make it for another generation or two. The the American and European middle and working class is screwed. A, a comment and then a question. The comment is, as you know, the Europeans are in fact talking about carbon barriers, if you will, that if you're going to import into Europe, you're going to pay a tax if you're on the carbon content, which presumably is going to encourage production in Europe. We'll see if that works. Uh, but, but the question is, we need to pivot from analysis to, I use air quotes on this word, solutions. Uh, clearly, we've got a climate issue. Clearly, we've got a technocracy issue. Clearly, we have an economic concentration issue, the likes of which we haven't seen for a long, long, long time. We're at least back to the Gilded Age, and that is pales actually by comparison, but it's it's in our history. Um, and we've got, I don't know if it's a flawed democracy, but we certainly have this disconnect between the problems the voters and solutions. And, and you've described all that both today and in various of your writings. The obvious question is, do we just Thelma and Louise like drive over that cliff, which you just said we may well do. And it's probably my forecast as well. But if we avoid the cliff, how, put it differently, how do we avoid the cliff? What, what things might we do? Well, I think there are several things on the uh, on the production side, obviously, you know, reshoring. And I think there are people in both political parties who are, who are pushing this. I think Wall Street and Silicon Valley is again, are, again, uh, are largely against it, although Intel is certainly pushing in the other direction um, to, uh, to their credit. Um, we have to maintain um, the, the production base so that we have enough wealth to address all the other problems. I mean, the, you know, expanding the welfare state and deindustrialization don't, don't really go well together. You know, we forget that the European welfare state, particularly the one in Scandinavia, had its roots in a very strong international position in the world economy. I mean, you can't have a welfare state long term that is successful um, unless you have a strong economy. That's the difference between Sweden and Argentina, for instance. Um, so I think that, that there's an economic one. The other thing is I think we're going to have to I think we're either we're going to have to break up the tech companies or we're going to have to declare them common carriers and allow and 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 make it um uh make sure that people have access. I mean this business like look I'm not I I think vaccines are a good thing and people should take them. But this idea that GoFundMe can decide all of a sudden we're not going to we're not going to allow the Canadian truckers to to raise money um, we're going to start. You know, we're going to start defunding uh, publications we don't like. You know, to me, the classic was taking the New York Post, the oldest newspaper in the United States, founded by Alexander Hamilton, and we 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 pulled the plug on it because it ran a story which was inconvenient politically to the oligarchs. You don't think we're headed in that direction? The real distinction today is between a completely controlled Chinese techno technocracy and a somewhat less oppressive American technocracy with a dominated by a few people. I mean, it's, it's certainly better, but we have got to be able to say, look, the basis of America is a middle class, it's dispersion of property, and it's the prospect of upward mobility. You take those things away and the whole purpose of the United States is, is just disappears. Let's talk a bit more about the American middle class. The traditional idea, the caricature of the middle class was a home in the suburbs, two cars in the driveway, a couple kids, a dog, uh, and so forth. But underlying, the reality under that post-World War was the big expansion of home ownership. That created the middle class. We now live in a world where it's getting harder and harder, certainly for the young middle class or would-be middle class. To purchase a house. So we are, and I've just read again in today's papers, moving towards a rental society. And indeed, the techies would say, that's good. Who wants assets? It's much better. It's better use of wealth, etc. What happens to the middle class, do you think, if they become renters instead of 
homeowners over the next decade or two? Well, of course, you know, it's in the interests of the oligarchs and Wall Street that people put all their money into their stocks. <laughs> you know, that's all they, you know, they, uh, what happens is if you don't have homeowners and you don't have stable middle class communities, A, people, the, the birth rate, which is already low, will likely decline. And people will now have a different relationship to the state. You know, if you own something, you have a uh, um, some motivation to protect your community. Um, you look at the long term. Uh, you've got some security. They can't control everything. You can always sell your house, borrow against it to start a business. If you're merely a renter, you're just giving money to to the Wall Street assholes. I'm sorry to say, but that's how I feel about them. Uh, that's a technical term. That's a, a technical term, right? You know, they make more and more and more money. Um, you're always, you know, you're always um, paying at the company store, um, and so what you do is you, but you even your middle and upper middle class becomes very servile and very dependent on the state. And I think that's that's really a problem. So that's a world where uh, the middle class and others become more dependent on the state at the same time. And we saw this during COVID. The state has, in almost every country I know of, accumulated incredible amounts of power. We see the extreme in China with uh, talk about net zero, zero COVID, right. which allows them to shut down massive cities just because someone might have a, have have contracted COVID. The world you're describing does sound, I hate to say, a bit Orwellian. I would say it's more um, more out of Huxley. Um, <laughs> now, there's a distinction we're going to have to explain to people. Okay. I mean, uh, first of all, I, I love George Orwell, um, and he's an influence on me. And and but the world he was explaining was really the sort of Stalinist reality. You know, it was an extrapolation of Stalinism, basically, and to some extent, even National Socialism, but more Stalinism. Then what Huxley talked about, and I think it's partially because he was here in California, and he could see what was happening this movement to a sort of pleasure oriented society that's that's manipulated um and his his knowledge on on uh, biology meant that eventually people will be created in vats which you know i think is not um inconceivable within the next 20 years or uh, or some maybe 30 years um and a very very a rigid class system, but one that does not depend so much on repression as on, if you will, brainwashing or providing people with opportunities. You know, I'm thinking of the the ideal 21st century person in the Mark Zuckerberg universe is a single person living in a small apartment uh, with uh, uh, where they spend 80% of their time on the metaverse. Um, and maybe they, they, they call out to Uber Eats for, to, to eat. Um, and maybe they, you know, they, they do drugs or they drink or they, uh, or they water their plants or whatever it is that they do. But this is, you know, this is a human being who is not likely to be, um, an independent player, independent thinker, um, and I think that I think that's very much uh, the Huxley worldview. And if you read Huxley and um, Brave New World, and then Brave New World Revisited, he gets most of it right. The only thing I think he didn't uh, um, see was the rise of digital technology. And of course, how could he at that time? Um, but but I think that the model is a, a hierarchical society that is uh, in which people's emotions are properly um, uh, adjusted um, so that they accept where they are in their lives. And that's sort of probably where we end up. I don't think we can, we, um, the society can uh, stand endless, this endless polarization. There'll have to be some form of, of a consensus. And one of those um, ways of getting to a consensus would be sort of following a brave new world scenario. 
That's also a world that clearly is um, isolationist, to use an old term, that where, where the global connectivity is much reduced, uh, whether for climate reasons or for economic financial reasons. Um, it's a world that is quite different than that which we had all hoped for uh, not all that long ago. Right. No, it's, it's, it's really, you know, Technology gives us weapons to create a better future, but right now they're being used to a large extent to create a worse one. Well, the podcast hosted me was desperately trying to come up with a question that we'd leave on an upbeat, on an up note. But I think uh, because I agree with with much of what you said and certainly the notion that you just ended on, which is where I'd like to end, which is that technology's possibilities are endless, uh, but they're endlessly pu- pushing us in a direction that, that we should be resisting. Right. Yeah. And, and, but I, I mean, there, I mean, the technologies themselves are not necessarily negative and they could be very positive. It's just a question of, of how they're, how they're deployed and who controls them. And that is, I think, the bottom line. So thank you very much, Joel. I appreciated the conversation. Um, I'm glad we did this. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcast and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org Thank you and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. <laughs>